Here we are at Walton Lake, and uh, here we have a really good example of witches' brooms. On these two trees right in front of us, one has lost the top, and right at the place where the top was lost, it was lost because of a witch's broom. You can see the very different kind of growth right at the stem. And then on the tree in front of it here, closer to us, you can see another witch's broom. How do we define that? We define it by tightened up internodes. That means the branches are not elongated and they're branching out too much, too close. So they become like a broom. If we went close to that, we would likely find the actual dwarf mistletoe, which is the causal agent of this symptom. If we look up the canopy and look at the top crown, we can see that the branches have only this year's worth of needle growth. That's very clear on this same tree that we have in front of us, but also to the left, there is a canopy that has that kind of symptom very clearly. And that we call lion's tails, for obvious reasons. It does look like a, the tail of a lion. Dwarf mistletoe has this capacity to throw, shoot the seeds, its own seeds. This is, of course, a plant, a parasitic plant and it shoots the seeds down. So when you find a spot where there is dwarf mistletoe, you will find many trees that have the mistletoe in them. So now we're going to move to one shorter tree where we can look at the mistletoe itself. Okay, let's, let's go and see. Let's walk into here. And right here you find the mistletoe plant itself, which is a little bit green, but not enough to photosynthesize for itself. The photosynthate for this plant is the photosynthate that is synthesized by the pine tree itself. So this uh, mistletoe is pulling out carbohydrate, but also other nutrients. It becomes a sink of nutrients and carbohydrates so that the part of the tree where the mistletoe is growing in every one of these spots becomes that sink and, it be and starts growing more than the rest of the trunk or branch where it is. And so eventually, after a few years of this, the branch starts swelling and having all these deformations, pretty much like a canker. And we have a very good example of one of them up here in the main stem of this tree. You can see how this is wider than both above and below. Especially, it is much wider than the growth that is happening up here. That tells you that nutrients that are coming from the root through the stem and up into this area are being captured here, mostly by the mistletoe, but also the tree is just producing much more growth. This will make this trunk not only deformed and not very good for timber, but also more likely to break in a windstorm or with snow load. I'm going to cut out a small sample of this mistletoe plant so we can look at it more closely. It is difficult to see very closely but there are dark dots here that are the sinkers of the mistletoe running alongside the vessels of the pine tree. And here again, notice how much thicker the part is where the mistletoe is growing compared to the more distal parts of the branch. And notice how at the very, very tips of each one of these plants, we're beginning to see the formation of um, blossom buds that are going to produce the, the, uh, the fruit and the seed that eventually becomes shot out to colonize other trees nearby. This is very cool. 
this is a very clear mortality center. When you see many trees dying around a specific center and you see them dead all the way to the, to the ground, you can suspect root disease, something happening at the base of the tree. And it is very likely that we might find the, co the causal agent of this problem if we walk right into there. Let's go see. Every year we come to this spot, new trees have died as the disease moves outward from a center uh, beginning somewhere around here. And the trees again die completely entirely to the ground because the problem is happening at the root. Um, and start working on it. There is um, decomposition takes over to the point where the tree becomes very loose and it will break very close to the ground. Usually it will uproot and fall completely over. Like we can see, for example, here, another stump that has probably um, died a little bit earlier. Uh, it's still very, very strong. I would need to dig down to find the fruit bodies of the causal agent of this disease, and that is Heterobacidion anosum. Okay, so we're going to start looking at some bark beetles today. And you will see up here in front of us, there are two ponderosa pine trees here, and both of them have some yellowing foliage up at the top. And that's a good indication that, that tree is not doing well, and it's not doing well because of bark beetle attack. But the interesting thing to point out is the fact that this tree, particularly the one on the left of those two, still has some green foliage. And green foliage gives us a good indication that the bark beetles are likely to still be in that tree. And so we'll take a closer look at this tree, take some of the bark off from the lower part of the trunk, and see what we can find in the way of bark beetles under the bark. So let's go and take a look. So now that we've come to the trunk of the tree itself, we can see there are pitch tubes on the surface of the bark. And this is again a very good indication that we have bark beetle activity here. These pitch tubes are where the resin flows out of the tree as the adult bark beetles are eating their way in through the bark, through the outer bark to get to the inner bark. And so that's a really good indication that we have bark beetles here. This is a ponderosa pine tree. And so we would expect ponderosa pines to have western pine beetles as the bark beetle species attacking these trees. So we're going to take the bark off, have a look at the gallery system that the bark beetles uh, carve out in the phloem tissue on the inner side of the bark and look and see if it really is western pine beetle. So let's see if we can take some bark off here. The, the nice thing about taking bark off is you want to get as big a piece as you can. And that's starting off with a very small piece, which is not quite what we want to do. But bark is not always easy to get off when these bark beetles are active. And what we want to try and do is get a nice piece of bark off without destroying all the galleries that are inside on the phloem tissue. So that's a better piece of bark. And we can see some gallery systems in here. These are the the maternal galleries of western pine beetle. We know that because spaghetti western. That's the key. Spaghetti western is like spaghetti has been dropped onto the surface of the park, and you have these wonderful meandering galleries. And those are the maternal galleries carved out by the 
the pioneer beetles that have bored their way under the bark. You will also see on this bark that there are some black staining on the inside of the bark here. You can also see the black staining on the sapwood of the timber of the tree here. And this is blue stain fungi. And blue stain fungi are very closely associated with these types of bark beetles. Dendroctonus bark beetles. This is Dendroctonus brevicomis, the western pine beetle. And it's a really interesting beetle. It's a fascinating beetle because if we look at this gallery system, you can see the maternal galleries meandering through that bark. But where are the larvae? Where are the larvae of these beetles? Typically for bark beetles, you would see larval galleries coming off perpendicularly to these maternal galleries. Smaller little galleries where the larvae are feeding on the blue stain fungi because they are fungal feeders. And we don't see that. We don't see any larval galleries. That's very strange. So where are those larvae? It turns out that for this particular bark beetle species, the larvae spend their time in the outer bark, not feeding on the phloem tissue on the inside of the bark here, like most bark beetles would do, but they're feeding in the outer bark. The outer bark you would think is an impossible place to live in, because they can't eat that bark easily. And what the blue stain fungus does is it radiates into the sapwood of the tree, pulls nutrients out of the tree, and pulls those into the outer bark where the bark beetle larvae feed on that fungus. So that's absolutely fascinating. There are two types of fungi associated with this western pine beetle. One is the blue stain fungus that we see the staining of on the bark and on the sapwood of the tree. And then there's another fungus, um, Entomocortesium. And Entomocortesium is a fungus that does well in the outer bark. Again, it's extracting nutrients out of the sapwood of the tree and pulling them into the outer bark where the bark beetle larvae are then feeding on them. So, let's see if we can find some of these larvae. And to find the larvae, we have to very carefully take off some of the outer bark. Oh, that's not a good bit. That's not a good bit. Let's see if we can very carefully shave some of this bark off to fat oh. Of course, when you do this, you slice the larvae in half. <laughs> but we're, we're beginning to see some of those larvae. And hopefully we'll find a nice little patch where we can see those larvae more easily. There's, there's a nice little larva, and we may need to zoom in on that to be able to see it more easily. Ah, there's another one popping its head out. And these, these larvae are right in the outer bark, not in the phloem tissue. And that's so unique about this particular beetle. Western pine beetle is quite unlike any of the other bark beetles that we have because it's the only one that spends most of its larval stage sitting in the outer bark where it's just feeding on fungi. Wonderful insect, but unfortunately it does cause the death of the tree. 
Is it just the beetle that kills the tree? Or is it the fungi that help to kill the tree? And it's a combination of both. What happens is as these beetle galleries radiate out around the circumference of the tree, they cut off the transport system for the tree and that causes the tree to die. And it's partly due to the galleries of the beetles and it's partly due to the activity of the blue stain fungi in particular. So I think um, what, what I will do at this point is actually try on the next tree to see if I can get a better view of, of some of the galleries while we also take uh, a more in-depth look at some of these larvae. Okay, so now that we've taken off a larger section of the bark here, you can see how dense those maternal galleries are carved out by the female beetles that attack this tree. They mass attack the tree, attracted in by aggregation pheromones, chemical signals that bring them all in to attack the tree at the same time and overcome the resin defenses that we saw evidence of through the pitch tubes, those points of entry. Now, bark beetles, of course, have natural enemies too, predators and parasitoids, insect um, wasps, parasitic wasps that attack them. And we see under the bark of this tree a number of larvae of the predator that is known as the red-bellied clarid. Beautiful name. And the red belly is all about the adult, which I hope we'll see at some point uh, later on today as well. And these predators can move through the bark very easily and are really important in helping to reduce the number of offspring that are produced from an attacked tree like this. So we've got some larvae in the outer bark here, but the trick is to be able to access them without cutting them in half. And so I'm just trying to shave off a little bit more of the bark to expose those larvae a little better so that we can see what they look like. They are comma-shaped larvae, and they are white with a brown head. And that's, the, that's what we're trying to expose here as we very carefully, and we don't want the, the larva to drop out, but it's nicely exposed there at the end of the knife. And this one, although it's a little bit um, squashed at one end, you can see the head of the larva right at the end of the knife there. Let's consider this tree. It's clear that the needles down here are all nice and green, seems very healthy, but you notice it has been topped. It broke off and the part that broke off is now on the ground. The reason why that broke off is because there was something breaking the, the physical uh, cohesion of the wood up there, and that was white pine blister rust. So just the signs, the situation here tells you something caused the death of the bark and a de deformation of the wood enough to topple that when the wind came. Now let's compare this with another way in which these trees have died here in this site. Look at this. The whole tree came off, but not from the middle, from the base. Another sugar pine, also not broken in the middle, the canopy is apparently healthy, it's all green, but it uprooted from the base. The difference here is obviously you're dealing with a root disease problem. Enough fungal growth has happened here that saprotrophically the fungus has broken down the wood 
enough to make it mechanically unstable so when the wind blows the whole thing comes down. This is not Heterobasidion anosum. How do I know that? I know it because the decay is brown cubical rot. Brown cubical rot as opposed to white fibrillar rot. White and fibrillar would be heterobasidion. Brown, dry, cubical rot is Phaeolus schweinitzii, the cow patty fungus or the velvet top fungus. Here around in our area, all the, all the ground is full of that fungus and it would normally be fruiting so we would be able to find the conch among the roots here. But because this area has been uh, burnt recently, I think all the fruit bodies were burnt those, the, that, uh, in that occasion uh, two years ago. Thank you. I headed down this way to this tree that you can see has a changing color to the canopy of the tree. And this is a sugar pine, and we're going to be looking for mountain pine beetle as the bark beetle that attacks this tree. So let's head on down this way. So now that we're at the base of this sugar pine tree, we can see that the canopy is dying back. And that's a pretty good indication that there's likely to be bark beetles here, the mountain pine beetle. The base of the trunk does show some evidence of pitch tubes like we saw on the western pine beetle. But they're a different color on this tree. They're a redder, it's a redder resin color. But it's again a good indication that bark beetles have gone into this particular tree. Mountain pine beetle is a much more standard bark beetle. It's a very aggressive tree killer. In many parts of the western region of the country, it has killed extensively lodgepole pine forests. But here in this uh, Blodgett forest, we don't have so much lodgepole pine at this elevation. And the main tree that we found mountain pine beetle in is this sugar pine. So what we will do is take off some of the bark, again to expose the galleries under the bark. This is a beetle that also carries blue stain fungi with it. It has two species of blue stain fungi that it inoculates into the phloem tissue under the bark. And there the, the larval stage of this mountain pine beetle is again a fungus feeder. And we will see that the larval galleries are very short, indicating that they're fungal feeding. So what I'll do now is to start taking off some of this bark so that we can expose those galleries. And hopefully sugar pine is even more difficult than uh, ponderosa pine for getting bark off in nice pieces. So I will try and get a big enough piece so that we can see the gallery system for this particular bark beetle. Ooh, not quite the best. Let's try, oh, there's a nice larva though. We have a, oh, and some adult beetles this time. So we're gonna see some interesting things under the bark of this particular tree. So the mountain pine beetle has vertical maternal galleries. And you can see here is a maternal gallery starting at the top of this piece of bark. And it's working its way down here, all the way down for quite some length. This must be about two or three feet long as a maternal gallery. And that's a gallery carved out by just a single adult female as she lays her eggs on each side of the gallery. Wonderful. And there's, there's a beautiful adult beetle walking around on this side here. 
and it's so um, although this is a really aggressive tree killing bite beetle we are lucky enough in California that we have not seen the very large-scale outbreaks of this beetle that have occurred further north in the western region of the country and up into British Columbia. And all the devastation that has occurred in lodgepole pine forests from British Columbia down through Colorado has been more extensive than we've ever, ever seen before. But luckily, because we have mixed conifer forests here, we don't have single species stands for this very aggressive tree-killing bark beetle to, to attack. So this is the first time I have ever seen this mountain pine beetle here in the Blodgett Forest. We've been coming here with our classes for many years and we've never seen it here before. So this is a rather unique opportunity to see that mountain pine beetle can be present here on sugar pine in this forest. Okay. We've looked at mountain pine beetle on this sugar pine, and now we're gonna go over here to this down tree, which is a ponderosa pine. And we're gonna look and see if we can find mountain pine beetle in a ponderosa pine. That's a much more unusual thing to, to see here in the Blodgett Forest because sugar pine is the main tree of this beetle. Ponderosa pine is a much more uncommon host tree. But we'll take a look and see what we can find. Oh, that's a good one. That's a nice one. So... Let's have a look at that. So this is ponderosa pine. And again, we can see the great long maternal galleries coming down this way. Mountain pine beetle again, because it's a vertical gallery. And you see the larval galleries radiating out to the side of those maternal galleries. And this is really interesting because here we see some cocoons at the ends of the larval galleries. And those cocoons are the cocoons that encase the pupil stage of a parasitic wasp. And these parasitic wasps will parasitize the developing larvae of the mountain pine beetle using an ovipositor to lay their eggs under the bark into the body of these mountain pine beetle larvae. There's a lot of parasitism there. That's quite unusual. We don't often see very much parasitism. And I think this is probably because we're looking at a ponderosa pine. And a ponderosa pine has a thinner bark than the sugar pine. And it's probably easier for the parasitic wasps to be able to reach the larval stage of these mountain pine beetles on the inner side of the bark here. So the attack of ponderosa pine is so much more unusual for mountain pine beetle, but clearly we have attack on both ponderosa pine and sugar pine here in Blodgett Forest this year. Beautiful gallery systems. We don't see any evidence of the, the um, predatory larvae that we saw on the, the ponderosa pine tree for western pine beetle. But that's a wonderful example of attack of a ponderosa pine by mountain pine beetle. So welcome from behind the sugar pine. This beautiful soft pine is an example of the hosts, the five needle pines, soft pines, sugar, and white pines are the hosts for this most important rust. Endocronartium ribicola, white pine blister rust. Let's follow this branch into the trunk. 
of the tree. I'm going to take it up for the camera's sake. Here you can see how from here up the canopy is still healthy, but right here around this area you have dead needles, dead branches, and most importantly a canker. White pine blister rust generates these blisters that usually would have lots and lots of orange rusty spores. It is a rust, remember. And it is those spores that will continue the cycle of infection of this fungus. But the thing you have to remember is for white pine blister rust, you need to have two hosts. And the secondary host has to be, or is, generally in the genus Ribis. This is why this is called Endocornartium ribicola, because it lives on Ribis half of its cycle. So how are you going to distinguish white pine blister rust? Obviously because of the host, because of the rusty and sappy kind of uh, blisters that come on it, but also because it is different from the other very important rust that we have here in the Sierras and throughout California, and that is the Western gold rust. Let me show it to you. Western gold rust is very different. It always comes in these almost spherical cankers very easy to distinguish, but also it happens on ponderosa pine, pine instead of sugar or white pine. It can be very small like that, but a single tree can have a whole canopy, many branches, covered in western gold rust. Peridermium harknesii, remember? All the way to larger and larger Sometimes even the whole trunk of the tree will be covered by one of these. These will not kill the tree. Unlike white pine blister rust that will kill the tree, western gold rust doesn't really kill the tree. It might end up killing, a tree might end up dying, again because of the mechanical damage that is caused by the canker, and then it breaks, but it is not as if the rust is killing actively the living tissues of the tree. So very important difference between western gold rust, white pine, blister rust. Thank you. Black oak, beautiful tree. Look at this. And up in the canopy of the tree, this tree hasn't leafed out yet for the season. So what you see, any foliage you see, is not from the oak. It's actually a mistletoe. This is the leafy mistletoe not to be confused with the dwarf mistletoe that you find on pine-related species. The Pinaceae will have the dwarf mistletoe, whereas broadleaf trees like this beautiful black oak will have leafy mistletoe. What we're looking at here is a down branch and the, uh, there is some nice, very brown powder on the surface of the branch here, on the surface of the bark. And that's indicative of beetles coming out. And the beetle that we're looking for here is called the California five-spined ips. Ips in the tips. Normally it's a beetle that lives in the very tips of the trees. And it will kill the tips of the trees, but we don't have any evidence of that here at Blodgett at the moment. So we're going to look for the Ips beetles here in this branch, and I'm just cutting away some of this bark to expose the, the beetles underneath. And this is a small beetle. It's so much smaller than the mountain pine beetle and the western pine beetle that we dealt with before. It's a very interesting shaped beetle because it has the end of its wing cases sort of punched in with a cavity. 
and it's called the five spined ips because it has five spines on the edge of the cavity at the back end of the body. So you can see the beetles here are adults. They've gone through their life cycle under the bark here and they are just beginning to emerge from this branch. This, this type of a beetle has three to five generations each year. So they turn over their generations very, very quickly. They can kill the tips of the trees, but they're otherwise not that damaging. And they often persist by just making use of fallen branches like they're doing in this case here. The galleries are rather different for this beetle than we've seen for the the other two bark beetles so far today. And this one has a tuning fork shaped gallery because in this case, male beetles are the first ones to come in and bore their way under the bark. And each male attracts three females to come and join him. And each one of those females carves out her own maternal gallery. And that leads to a tuning fork shape. And we might get to be able to see a, a tuning fork shape if I take some more of the bark off here. I'll try and get it off carefully so that we can get a chance to see some of that shape. Oh, you can almost see the tuning fork in this piece here. There are three arms here, one going down, two going up, and right in the middle here is the nuptial chamber. This is where the, the male sits to attract three females to come and join him. And the maternal gallery, there's one going down, another female coming up this side, and a third one coming up this side. But you can see they've been feeding so much under the bark here that it's, it's more difficult to see the shapes of those maternal galleries now. And that's the five spine dips. <laughs> okay, so we are now looking at a combination of insects in this particular down tree, one of which is a bark beetle, the fur engraver, and the other of which is a wood boring beetle. And a flat headed borer is what I think we're going to be finding under the bark of this particular tree. So I'm going to take some bark off here and then we'll look at some of the, the details of the gallery systems that we find underneath. So let's see if I can get this that's off easily, which let's see if we may or may not find any underneath. Aha, uh -huh. there we have it. There we have it in the end. So here we see a lava, and this is the lava of a wood boring beetle. It's actually a lava of what we call a round-headed borer. A round-headed borer goes into the wood. It starts its galleries by meandering around on the surface of the wood. And then eventually it will go straight down into the wood itself and it pupates inside the timber of the tree. These are not tree-killing bark, be uh, tree beetles like the bark beetles, but they are well-known insects associated with dead trees. Do you see here the boring material? You can see strands of fibers of wood in the boring material. That's another good indicator of a round-headed borer. So that's interesting. And then we just take, also while we're here, we take a look at the timber here. And this is another bark beetle. 
This is another type of bark beetle. This is the maternal gallery. The bark beetle is called the fur engraver. It doesn't mass attack trees, but it can kill trees. And like the ips that we just saw, they often are more commonly found in the tops of the trees rather than all the way to the base. And this is the maternal gallery. It's going across the grain of the timber. Unlike the previous, the bark beetles we've seen previously, which tend to go vertically up and down with their maternal galleries. And you can see the tremendous length here of the larval galleries. You can see that they start off very small in size, coming off the maternal gallery, and they get wider and wider as those larvae grow. Now these larvae are not feeding on fungi like the mountain pine beetle and the western pine beetle. These guys are feeding just on the phloem tissue, which is the very inner layer of the bark. And you can tell that they are phloem feeders because of the tremendous length of these galleries. They need to eat a lot of phloem to get the nutrition to be able to complete the larval stage. So we have larval galleries going both below and above that maternal gallery. And here we have the gallery of a flat-headed borer. We don't see the larva of that flat-headed borer, but here, instead of having the very coarse-grained boring material, it's a very fine, powdery boring material. And that's a characteristic of flat-headed borers. I want to show you some of the relationships between the dwarf mistletoe over a long period of time and trees as, as they mature. So have a look at this tree and look up there. You can see the remains or what used to be a witch's broom, which is a sign that we had dwarf mistletoe. That dwarf mistletoe, even though the tree took 80, maybe 100 years growing, it wouldn't kill it, but eventually the canker that formed around, around that mist mistletoe um, allow the tree to be broken up. Bad thing, bad fate for the tree. However, if you are interested in other values for that trunk, you might want to have a closer look at what is going on with it. And if you come with me, let's climb up here. You'll watch me climb, maybe, to get to something really super interesting. Oh, what if I die? Look. This is Fomitopsis pinicola, a sapwood decompo decomposer. It's decomposing the wood in this tree and making it available for animals like woodpeckers who will start a whole cascade of borrowing and opening living spaces. So this trunk becomes really valuable to wildlife as it is. And so the mistletoe is bad for lumber, but it might be very good for wildlife. That's it. All right. Here at this site, we are looking at some ponderosa pines again. We've got a cluster here of about six ponderosa pines. And as we look up at the main trunk of these trees in front of us, what we see is that the bark has been totally stripped off the top half of the tree. Now that stripping of the bark is due to woodpeckers. And woodpeckers are looking for insects that are living under the bark there. And the insects that are most likely to be the food source for these, these woodpeckers are the flat-headed borers. 
these flat-headed borers that are mining and carving out galleries underneath the bark in that rather meandering way, very broad galleries. And it's a wonderful food source for woodpeckers. Tremendous. So if we look up at the top of the tree, the other important thing to notice is that the canopy of the tree is still green. That's another really good indicator for us that we're dealing with flat-headed borers on this tree rather than bark beetles. Because if it was bark beetles that the woodpeckers had been going for, the canopy would have turned a yellow color, might even be a reddish color by this point in time. So that's another indicator. Knowing these symptoms is so important for trying to identify what are the active insects um, feeding up and down underneath the bark of these larger trees. So what we're also going to do here, we obviously can't get under the bark up there to find out whether it really is flat-headed borers, but I'm just asking you to believe me at this point that that's the most likely cause of that damage to the bark. And we're gonna go in and look more closely at the base of the trees because we have another bark beetle that we need to say something about that is active right down at the base of these ponderosa pines. So we'll head on over this way and take a look at the base of these trees. So now we're looking at the base of these trees and you will notice here some pitch tubes, very much larger pitch tubes than we've seen before for the other types of bark beetles. But this is indicative of the red turpentine beetle. And the red turpentine beetle is the largest of the bark beetles that we have in the Western region. And each of these multiple points of entry here is going to lead to a cavity-shaped gallery where the larvae feed gregariously in a single cavity. So very different from the typical bark beetles where the larvae are all separate, separated as they move out from the maternal gallery. In this case, the red turpentine beetle has larvae that just enlarge the maternal gallery. And the interesting thing about these beetles is they're not tree killers. This is a parasite of the tree. It doesn't want to kill the tree. It wants to be able to go year after year generating new generations of turpentine beetles as that tree remains healthy. It's a stress on the tree, but unlike the mountain pine beetle and the western pine beetle, red turpentine beetle is not a tree killer. So what we're going to do now is take some of the bark off here and see if we can open out those galleries and find some of the larvae that are developing inside there. Open that up a little bit to make sure there's nobody in there. There's another gallery. So let's do this carefully and see if we can find some larvae here. Looks like, oh, there's one. There's one down here. There's another. There's, so we're just beginning to open up a gallery here and hopefully we'll find a few more. So this is a cavity gallery. I'm gonna switch to a knife now rather than anything else to see if I can open that up a little bit more carefully. Oh, it's such tough bark there. But there you see the there you see the beautiful 
example of a red turpentine beetle larva with again a brown head and a comma-shaped whitish body. You can see this bark beetle is quite a bit bigger than anything we've seen before. And that's, um, it should be as a, a group of larvae feeding together. So I think I'll have to get back to uh, this to open it up a bit more. Okay. Oh, look at that. That is a beautiful example of a red turpentine beetle larva. Huge by bark beetle standards. Pretty small, you might think, but it's huge as a bark beetle larva. And this is feeding in inside this communal cavity gallery. And there would be probably about 20 of them feeding together. And there they have no fungi associated with them that they're feeding on. They're just feeding directly on the phloem tissue on the very inner side of the bark of these trees. That's a beautiful thing to see. So here we've got an example of the red turpentine beetle gallery. The female entered at this point into the bark and once she got through to the phloem layer on the inside of the bark, she curved out her maternal gallery following this route down through the, the bark here. And she lays eggs in clusters as she goes, and those eggs hatch to produce larvae that feed gregariously as a group together, and they're enlarging that maternal gallery to form something of a pouch-shaped gallery that they complete their development within. And that's, um, that's a great example. And these are, these are just parasitic because they are not in any way going to result in the death of the tree. And um, it's nice to see such nice galleries. Let's talk about value. When I consider the majestic size of this big tree, what is it, maybe 120 years old, and I'm interested in lumber, I can see a very large number of board feet in there. To the person who doesn't know how to look for fungi or for disease, they might decide this is valuable, very valuable as lumber. But if you have the right training and you're looking for the right things, you might have binoculars with you. And if I look with my binoculars, I see that under every single branch trace where a branch is coming out, there is a conch. Or there used to be a conch and I still see the traces of it on this side. This tree is completely colonized in the hardwood by Echinodontium tinctorius, which is the Indian paint fungus. This fungus goes in through a branch, a very small branch when the tree is young, and can colonize saprophytically, saprotrophically, into the hardwood. Even before the hardwood is formed, it just sits there and it can sit for decades, demonstrated at least 50 years. It can sit there and wait and wait and wait until the tree becomes large and there is enough red, enough hardwood to grow in because it really loves the hardwood. And then it develops into this massive, massive genet, a single clone, single genetic individual, the size of an elephant or the size of a little whale inside a tree. And it hollows it out. So that hollowed out tree becomes a gr great possibility for wildlife. So from the, point of view, point, from the point of view of lumber, this tree is really worthless. And it actually can represent some danger when it breaks and crashes onto a house or a car or whatever. But then there are other values. From the point of view of wildlife, this is an incredibly valuable tree. And that is the reason why there is a label, a special label at the base that says, do not cut. This is a wildlife tree, all thanks to the hard rot that is inside this massive tree.